As we've been talking about, one of the chief concerns in Japan right now is a nuclear meltdown, with President Obama touting atomic energy as green energy these days. The nuclear power industry had just about lived down previous disasters like Chernobyl and Three Mile Island. The last Friday's earthquake and subsequent tsunami has led to still untold disaster. Meltdowns are now a real possibility, and the world once again has reason to question and fear the power of the atom. By most accounts, the nuclear crisis in northern Japan is escalating. You are looking at before and after the explosion. The picture below is before the explosion, above, after. Today, an explosion ripped through the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station, tearing apart the structure around reactor number three. On Saturday, a similar explosion hit reactor one. Now, officials are using the word no one wants to hear. We do s believe that there is a possibility that meltdown has occurred. It is inside the reactor. We can't see. However, we are acting, assuming that a meltdown has occurred. Plant administrators have already been forced to vent radioactive steam several times. Nearby residents have been told to stay indoors as fear and radiation levels rise. I'm due to give birth soon. I want to know exactly what's going on at the nuclear plant. The problems in Japan are also raising concerns in the U.S., where the Obama administration is pushing new nuclear construction. We're going to have to build a new generation of safe, clean nuclear power plants in America. We visited the Pilgrim nuclear power station last March. Officials there called the plant a key player in the state's energy future. I believe that it's the uh, most cost-effective way without producing greenhouse gases to provide power for 680,000 or so homes on the, in the state of Massachusetts. Pilgrim officials also said they've prepared the Plymouth plant for any emergency, be it terrorism or a natural disaster. But officials in Japan now say their best laid plans were simply overwhelmed by nature's fury. We thought we had taken adequate precautions for a tsunami, but what happened was beyond our expectations. And joining me now is Jim Walsh with the MIT Security Studies Program, Gilbert Brown, a professor with the Nuclear Engineering Program at UMass Lowell, and Alan Kafka, a professor of geophysics at Boston College. Welcome to all of you. Jim, I'll start with you. We're hearing phrases now like total disarray, don't know what to do. In Japan, is dealing with a, a ca catastrophe of this level unprecedented? It is. It's unprecedented in part because uh, there are so many plants in play, and the whole country is facing devastation. And, and so you're already starting from a position of trauma and shock. That, you know, People are trying to get their bearings. They have lost loved ones. And then you have the first reactor uh, have problems, then a second, and then last night a third. Uh, so we're, there are a lot of uncertainties here. You know, we're pouring seawater into a, uh, a, a reactor vessel, you don't do that very often. That's your last-ditch effort. And this uh, is, a, from what I understand, for, for, for the second reactor, this is the second time they're trying to fill it with seawater. The first time it, it, you know, it completely, I don't know, evaporated whatever happens to it, so they're trying it again. So it, these reactors have been exposed for quite a while. Well, uh, there's, there, again, and this is part of what we don't know. So there have been different water level readings in those reactors. I'm sure my colleagues can speak to this. Uh, there's some suspicion that maybe the meter reading that is has been wrong, but it's. I think there's some sense, and and, and for good reason, that in at least two of the reactors, some of those uh, uh, fuel elements have been exposed to air, and they have picked up cesium and iodine in air samples uh, around the plant. So, uh, you know, but at the, the bottom line here is that we're in a position no one expected us to be in. Uh, there are a lot, we're doing things for the first time that we haven't done before. There are multiple p plants in play uh, under a situation of stress and tension. So I, I, my heart goes out to the, the Japanese people and to the people who are working 24-7 dealing with this new and, and uh, ever-changing problem. Well, with those people, do you have a sense of how adequately they're going to be able to deal with it since it is a relatively uncharted territory? Well, I was happy to hear today that we are having now international teams arrive from the United States, from the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, other countries are stepping in uh, because you've got to figure that, yes, uh, uh, the nuclear industry in Japan is large, uh, supplies about a third of its electricity, but uh, you know, I, I, these guys must be, men and women must be working all the time under very difficult circumstances. And I, they probably need the support that's coming in right now. Well, Gil, how are they working? You have to wonder, because there is some level of radioactivity around, how are they actually working on this? Can they get near, can they get accurate readings? Well, first of all, I don't know what's going on specifically 
with the workers, and, uh, and I, don't, I don't know the readings of the radiation exposure that, that is happening there. But what we do know is what you said is that the plant um, survived an earthquake that was frankly about uh, one and a half times what the, or the, the 15 times what it was designed for. It was a nine earthquake, I think seven and a half, 7.5 is what it was designed for. And it survived that. And uh, the emergency systems worked, but unfortunately there was also a, a taller than anticipated tidal wave or tsunami. So there was a flood wall, but it breached the flood wall. And that took out the emergency uh, diesels. So the station goes into a blackout condition. These are conditions that are practiced, actually, in emergency planning at all the reactors that I know of. And so what they're doing is rehearsed behaviors on how to deal with the cooling of the plant in the event that you don't have any power. The, the, what, what we're talking about with the seawater is, okay, you don't want to have seawater. You, you usually have big tanks of, of stored water accumulating water, accumulated water that you would then use to do what they're doing, which is called bleed and feed. It sounds, I don't know if that sounds, <laughs> what that sounds like, but it, uh, it's the technical term of sort of bleeding off the steam and refeeding the, the tank with water. And, and how are they doing that, though? I, I know you don't understand the particulars in, in this case, but, but in a situation like this, how are they doing that? Are they doing it remotely? Do they have suits? How, how physically does it happen? Well, I think there's pipes and, and, uh, and valves and opportunities to get water into an uh, otherwise closed system. And so I, I like to give you an analogy of, of a tea kettle that has a flame underneath it and water in it, and in the beginning nothing happens, and then eventually you start to boil, and you eventually you have a whistling. When the pressure builds up, you have enough whistling. And then you open the top, and you relieve your big puff of steam, and then you can pour more water into the tea kettle, and you can continue that process. If you don't pour more water back in, then eventually you're going to whistle and whistle and whistle until the, the kettle runs dry, and then you could sort of warp or ruin the tea kettle. And that's where your meltdown comes. That's, that's kind of where the, the metal gets damaged at that point, yeah. Alan, let me bring you in. As all of this is unfolding, there's still concern about a second quake that is to come. You know, people are expecting a, a 7.0 size earthquake. I mean, is that well, really it, likely? It's, it's, it's very typical um, after an earthquake, a main, what we call a main shock, uh, a big earthquake, it's very typical in an aftershock sequence to get an earthquake that would be about one magnitude unit less. Um, so, you know, th there have been aftershocks going on every day at the magnitude 5 level. Well, this is all a very normal aftershock sequence, and yes, to have an earthquake, um, a magnitude unit or two less than that, and, and a 7 is really big, and we were just told that uh, the plant was originally made to withstand a 7. Uh, so a, a 7 is, is a, about, about once a month. Uh, somewhere on Earth, there's a magnitude seven earthquake. Um, so it's so would it happen in the same area? Is that typically how it works? And could there be another tsunami that follows? 